Okay, so just a uh, quick demo of uh, one of my one of my projects, which I'm hoping to release as an open source package soon, if I can figure out <laughs> exactly how to do that. But anyway, um, we have a few virtual machines here. Well, they're LXC containers, just for test purposes. Um, we have the jump host, which is essentially a SSH Bastion host, jump host, um, combined with the uh, AKC or Open AKC server. Um, we have uh, a you know, demonstration workstation, a demonstration server, which would be mm, some kind of server that you know, or an example of one of many servers that you wanted to control access to, and an example. Uh, third-party uh, host which might be you know some host outside of your network that that you need to give access uh, to so these are vanilla um, containers just been um, just been built uh, they all have um, telnet and Joe is my editor of choice <laughs> installed um, and the uh, jump host slash you know, the, the one that's actually going to have the security service software installed also has XRNetD installed. Uh, Telnet's just there for um, you know demonstration purposes. Um, so on the server, that's uh, when you uh, when you get the pack. Well, I mean ultimately it'll be in a uh, in a repo, but. Um, when you see the packages, there's three packages, and these will be either devs or RPMs, depending on what your platform is. Um, these are definitely pre-release um, versions. Um, it'll probably be sort of 1.05 by the time I'm ready to, to release it, because um, there's a few features that aren't fully implemented yet, and I need to do code review and have a have a look through it and make sure that I'm happy with everything. But for the moment let's do a demo um, on the server you need to install the server package and ideally the tools package um, if currently the um, the server package depends on the tools package um, it may not have to be like that but it's it, it's definitely best so we'll install those two and um, I should add that um, I've uh, I've just put the IPs for all these containers into the etc hosts just for the demo um, and I've actually these are the default names when you install the client package it assumes that there'll be two servers and those will be the names um, unless you deploy a configuration file um, but for the demo, I'm just going to just put um, the, the default names in so we don't have to um, initially mess around with the configuration. So on your, you know, on the servers in your estate that you're trying to manage, you would just install the package. Uh, install uh, this one, oh, just the actual OpenAKC agent package. And install that now um, because these are completely blank I need a, um, a sample user to test with um, so I'm going to do create a user um, doesn't really matter what the password is because I'm not actually going to type it in no information there um, and just to demonstrate that now I've run the install, the server is actually working. Uh, turn it to localhost on the default port. You get um, a server, um, and uh, that's running. So um, now if I um, Become the uh, the user that we're uh, we're about to test with, um, and 
I say, okay, I need to create a uh, SSH key, which it will enforce as a passphrase. So I'm going to do SSH keygen. Create myself a default RSA key with a passphrase. Now that's that's done. Now the the tools package contains this little tool which will be the tool that um, interfaces you with the system. And the very first thing that uh, all the users have to do is register their SSH key. Uh, so you would just run uh, open AKC register. Um, and that's going to, here it says the password, passphrase is re uh, requested to ensure you own this key. As part of the um, validation process before it registers it to the back end. And the um, uh, the output from this pre-release version is still a little debuggy, so you'll see extra output that you might not see when it when I release it, but um, I'll go through what it what it actually means as we do it. Um, so if I enter the passphrase just to validate that key. Um, so what it's saying checks out which which protocol versions the server supports knows which versions the client supports selects a compatible protocol um, the before and after the uh, decimal point determines yeah, you don't really need to know that but essentially the after the decimal point it uh, it's dependent on which version of uh, OpenSSL you have installed um, so the first thing it did um, is try to escalate its permissions. Um, and this is based on a public private key pair. And I did not have to put that key in place um, because the security server and the jump server is the same machine. So uh, the the first time the server ran, it put the key in the right place. But if, for example, you had a Bastion host and a security server, which were two different machines, you would need to look um, in the Valib Open OKC keys directory and copy the right the system key um, to the uh, to the other host. And what that essentially does is tell it that these two systems um, are using the same backend to authenticate. So for the demo, I'm just using local authentication, which is why I'm doing it on the same shared host, because my user is in etc. password. Um, and obviously, in reality, it could be AD or LDAP or NIST plus or whatever, whatever you like. Um, but for the demo, I'm using a local user, um, and so I'm sharing the security server and the and the Bastion host, um, so that they have the same they have the same set of users. Um, and so once it's got those keys um, uh, and validated that, it can upload my um, personal or the, the personal uh, SSH key for this user. Um, and then this message, I'm I'm debating whether to um, to remove the the code that does that or not. But but basically, because the API tool is based on the same code that does the actual backend, um, it has a it has a um, mechanism for for swinging over to the to the secondary um, uh, server if there's multiple API servers very quickly. Um, and unfortunately, in a, in a shell script, that's quite hard to do. So it does unfortunately leave this terminated message, which I'm working on getting rid of. But for the moment, it's just a message that says you're going to expect to see this message. That's fine anyway. So now I have this user created. I have this test server over here, um, which I might want to log into. Uh, and if I say, oh, well, let's, let's SSH 
and let's be root. Let's 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 be root. Let's let's SSH to root. Oh, over here. Get rid of that. Um, I'll see what it says. Obviously, can't log in. That's good. Um, now, I also need um, I need a security administrator in order to define somebody who has um, access, so or to be able to control who has access, shall we say? Um, and let's make this user here um, the security administrator as well. So now we say okay. Um, now that I've run the um, the registration tool, uh, it should have created a dot open akc folder in my home directory, um, and it, and now you'll find three keys in there. One of them is the public key for the server. Um, or any server that it's communicated with. This one's for localhost. So the very first time it communicates with the server, it'll collect this public key. And after that, um, if the server changes, um, you'll have to reset this public key. Otherwise, it will stop communicating. It's actually the same as SSH does, just to stop a you know the man in the middle type attack or a uh, um, the server being changed or uh, compromised. Um, and it also uses this key to uh, seed the encryption um, that it uses to, to communicate with the server. And it will also generate you a personal, public and private key for your user. Um, and you can then take this public key and place it onto the server. And that will change your rights from just a generic user to uh, an administrator of the system which then allows you to edit the uh, access control files etc so i'm going to take this public key file get that however you however you really choose to do this so you can then Go into Farlib, open agency key, keys, and you'll see the server keys there. Um, client and server. Um, these ones are for the communication with the client, and these ones are um, for communication with the system API, whereas obviously if I put a user key in there, that will use that for specific user rights. Um, so I'm now going to cat. Actually, let me, uh, let me just demonstrate that it doesn't work unless I do this. So I'll go back to the J. Lewis user and I'm going to say, okay, well, I need to do edit role for root at test hyphen server that says can I find necessary public key and it actually gives you the location that it's expecting to find uh, that key so essentially it tried to gain the privilege required to edit the uh, the role configuration there and no bueno um, so let me go back to this directory um, and it, I mean, obviously, this is telling you where it's expecting to find that key. So if I can do that, um, we take the key that we had from here. Make sure we get it all. You obviously copy it or cut and paste it or however you prefer to put it in there. And then. Um, I'll go back to B, BJ Lewis again. And if I run open AKC edit role root at test server again, um, you can do get role or set role, which allows you to download or upload the file, or you can do edit role, which loads your 
predetermined editor. I didn't define the editor variable, so it's given me vi, which is fine, I guess. Um, and gives you a sort of example um, role, uh, role configuration. And you can put multiple blocks of these, and it will pick the first one that, that matches. So I'm just going to uh, copy the example. Um, take away the comments. And this this is a definition of the uh, date range that this is valid from. So I'm going to make it because it's expired already. So I'm going to make that from 2020 to 2021. Stops at time as well if you're uh, really bothered. So you could have some uh, you could have some uh, privilege access management uh, process that would um, enter these values. So if you have some approval process that says this person has access from this period to that period, then you could do that. Um, now this here defines the type of uh, the type of uh, resource that we're defining. So we are defining um, a user and that user is J Lewis. Um, and they have access on any day during any time. So I could say, um, you know, Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., whatever. Uh, override the shell. This is a list of commands that they would be able to execute if they were doing a, uh, you know, non interactive login. So they were just running SSH hostname ls or something. Um, for SCP, we can do a, um, this is like a, you know, re search replace. So we're search replacing slash with slash data. So essentially you're cheerooting anything that goes via SCP. Um, then this is a comma separated list of kernel capabilities that are denied to this, to the, to this, to, to the login permitted by this role. Are we recording the session and just a list of uh, IP addresses from which you can log in, which is currently any. So, um, we'll save that and it will upload it back to the server. Um, you'll notice that this permission here was defined as user and not system. In this in this example, a user is a more granular and so more privileged um, position than system because everybody has to have the system role in order to be able to um, register their personal keys. So now that I've defined to say J Lewis um, has access to, uh, to that thing, then I should be able to just SSH to root at this host. And it's asking me for my passphrase. Um, and I, I can log in and it says that as an open AKC session has been initialized. Um, it's going to ask me some questions about why I'm logging on, what my what my change number is. Let's say my change number is 1234. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's not it's not necessarily completely required for you to fill this in at this point, but um, you can turn it on and off in the configuration as well, whether it actually does ask the questions but um for a record of you know what people were doing when they were logging in you can you can encourage them to give you an answer um just doing a test of the system blank line to end um and then it's it's uh stated that these capabilities have been withdrawn and so um For example, this uh, Linux immutable would mean that if a file was marked as immutable, you would not be able to remove the immutable flag, even if you're root. And in fact, if you if you permit a login as a non-root user, um, then even with sudo minus s or you know, sudo sudo su hyphen or sudo minus s whatever. Um, you, that user cannot inherit that permission, so you could you know, deny various rights to uh, change network configuration or uh, snoop network traffic or 
whatever you feel is necessary. Uh, the, the default has Captain Linux Immutable in there because the, the intention is that um, the code for this tool itself will be marked as immutable. Um, and you could obviously, um, you know, you would obviously be encouraged not to allow people to log in as root in the first place. But if you have to let people log in as root or they have, um, you know, pseudo rules and they, they might be able to escape them, you can um, mitigate the their ability to edit the configuration of the machine or, you know, startup scripts, etc. Um, and particularly this, the, uh, the components involved in the tool, which, let, you know, which will, you know, obviously, if they can modify stuff as root, then you're in trouble to start with. But at least we can we try to try to mitigate that a little bit. Um, so I'm I'm now logged onto the system, the test server um, here as root. Um, now, obviously, security best practice would say to you, well, you probably shouldn't. Um, allow people to log in directly as root because then when you look in the in the log file um, you'll find that um, they were anonymous and you don't know exactly you know you know that this key connected but whose was it so let's have a look at that log file um, uh, auth log uh, can we make this wider? Let's see if we can make this wider. There we go. Um, I don't need the other host for a second. Um, so this is the start of the the session, the very first session where it's collecting the the server's RSA public key and sending audit data. This is um, on the very first connection, and I think every hundred connections currently. Um, configurable um, it will send information how many CPUs it has how much memory it has etc and this was the first attempt that when we tried to connect uh, as root and it says uh, the plugin auth user root denied um, from this source uh, it gives a session ID and which key it was and who registered that key um, and then once we'd actually um, uh, created the role that permits us to access, we have another one that says user root authenticated as test, um, uh, you know, root on test server. Uh, and we have session ID, um, which will become important later on, gives the key and says who that is. And then there is a configurable option um, which allows the okay well before we <laughs> the, the session which is after the user is logged in tells you that it's presenting the quiz which is the you know asking for why are you logging in etc and there's a configurable option which generates a fake sudo log um, which gives the, the basic information that sudo would give and says well the user J Lewis on this TTY um, and it gives extra information uh, logged into root or sudo to root came from this IP address ran this shell um, this is a session ID and the API server that authenticated and was this one um, and in fact uh, if we have a look uh, if we have a look at uh, OKC, uh, in the config file we will see that those are the APIs. The system is enabled. It's the port it's using. Currently, we're not caching anything, but that was um, an option for future use. We're not doing debug logging. Uh, that's the data directory. We are permitting root to be authenticated via the system. Um, obviously, in a large environment, you might decide that uh, you know root can only log in via some kind of break glass system or um, only via the console or some some other system. So you might want to disable root's ability to log in um, on certain systems, even um, audit controls whether um, uh, whether it sends the 
you know memory information and stuff like that back to the server quiz um, is controlling whether you're asking the user why they're logging on um, and the fake sudo determines whether you get this this output here um, and the reason why uh, it, it seem to be necessary to do this is a lot of uh, seam type security servers you know, security systems expect to see some kind of privilege escalation um, and actually if we look at the password file on here there's no there's no directory this is just a completely vanilla um, container if you look at the password file there certainly is no j lewis user here um, there's a, uh, a user that um, the OpenAKC agent runs as, um, but no J. Lewis user. But what it said is that it knows that this is J. Lewis because that was the user that registered the key against the directory that you're using. So even though you don't have to have a directory server attached to every one of your clients, um, and you you just have it on one on central security server, um, or a set of bastion hosts or however you want to set it up and the log file on the target will tell you who it was that logged in and what user they became even if those are those are role users application users or whatever so um, that's all good um, so let's come out of here um, and well uh, back to um, to having two windows um, so I could on the workstation um, create a user because I have the tools package installed on the workstation system um, or I plan to have the tools package installed on the workstation system let's do that um, uh, Tools. Right, so we've just installed the tools package, um, and from here, um, I might say, okay, the, this user, let's uh, let's call it, let's add a user and call them John, shall we? Add uh, user John. Yep, um, and John is going to need an SSH key. Um, Cypher key gen. Uh, need a passphrase as well. Actually, maybe John doesn't need an SSH key. Um, I'm not actually going to log in anywhere from John, but um, what we do want to do is we want to make John a administrator. So at the moment, this is on a separate machine, which is not necessary, which isn't the security server. Um, and so I might want to say, okay, let's um, edit the role for root at test type and server and it's going to say ah, so one of the things we now have to do is tell it where the server is so let's um, so it's going to look in two possible places it'll look in either system wide or in John's um, uh, you know John's own user so we should be able to because this is this is John's user and they are just um, they don't necessarily have total control of this system um, we're going to go into the open AKC directory which got created as soon as we try to do something um, and we'll look in there um, nothing in there as yet so we're going to config and 
we are going to say AP APIs equals uh, open AKCO1 and open AKCO2. So now I should be able to say edit role and it's contacted the server and the server has said, sorry, I don't know who you are. Um, and we can go through the same process we did before where we look in here and now we have John's public key um, and we can take that public key um, and we can go back to the server which is on a different host remember and we can be root on the server in the keys directory and we can say, oh, we're expecting to find this file, which is that file essentially, um, in the keys directory on the server to define this user as an administrator. So we'll cap that into there. We'll take John's public key for the system. This is not an SSH public key, this is the OpenAKC public key. Um, and we'll cut that into there and now we can go back to John and John is now on a completely different machine over the network able to run edit roll for that user um, and let's say we want to John wants to say that um, this person can only log in on Friday so they are going to change that to, oh, nope, Friday. Um, and that saved that back. So the point was that obviously you can have an administ you, you know, administrator workstation. This can doesn't have to be, it's, it's, it's done all over the network rather than um, doesn't access any files directly on the server to do that. Um, so we can now go back to the server um, and obviously we've got the two client keys as well um, but let's see what else we have um, we mentioned the audit so I could look in the audit folder and we have uh, you know, just various information this is actually not all of the information that it will collect but if the tools are not available, I will not attempt to collect them. So for example, the default uh, container doesn't contain LSPCI or LSUSB, etc. So those values are not there, but um, you could um, you could look at um, the routing table or what, uh, what swap space is configured or uh, what file systems are mounted etc just to give you you know some some extra information about the hosts you can turn that off obviously um, and there is key logs which will automatically create directories for the dates um, and this will show you that at 2019 uh, the user root at test server was logged into by J Lewis and that is the session ID. Um, so you could actually go back to the test server and find that entry in the, well, uh, 100 log, or log. So you'd find that this session here was 581 dash 007 F0 etc and so that there shows you that this session links to that one um, and you can um, cat that and you can see um, well you can see everything that happened and it, at the start actually you'll see that it says this is the title this is the summary this is the network source IPs, you know, information about the, the TTY and what shell type it was, what restrictions were applied, and then the 
essentially the script of what happened during that session. Um, we looked at a few logs, we looked at the contents of the um, config file, looked at the content of you know, the password file, etc. Um, and then obviously session exited with code zero. All good. Um, so go back to where we were. And there's one one other directory which is data. Um, now this is where it stores the information about the roles and what occurred, um, or what what users have registered, what keys, and um, what permissions are allowed. Um, now, if you want to have um, a cluster of uh, you know, multiple um, security servers that, that, that operate this. Um, currently, um, the only data plugin is file system. So um, if you wanted to have a cluster, you'd have to have a shared file system. So it could be NFS, you could put it on a NAS, or um, it could be, you know, cluster FS shared file system or um, Veritas shared file system, something as long as it can be written to from both. Um, but inside there, um, we have, um, there's a sessions directory, but this is just containing temporary information about each session. Um, those can be, well, will be aged out quite quickly. Um, it's just holds the information for the period of the authentication process because there are two stages in the authentication process, one before the user is actually logged in and one after the user is logged in. And because we're taking control of the session after the user logs in, we need to know what happened during the authentication process. So the server stores that temporarily there. Um, there is also the uh, roles directory where literally the configuration that you've edited remotely is stored. Um, Uh, we also have, um, oh, we were in data, weren't we? We also have keys, which will be registered keys, um, which are the, the keys that were registered. <laughs> um, this will be J. Lewis's key, so I could cat keys, um, which says here, there's the fingerprint, that's the username, it's the public uh, key. It's a, the type of key is a user's key, uh, date stamp. So in the future, we'll give the ability to um, have keys expired at a particular time. And then personal key for J. Lewis was automatically added as a comment. Um, then we have one remaining, oh no, two remaining directories. There is a hosts directory. Um, So we have a test server, um, which is just information about that host. Um, now, if it doesn't have a file for that particular host, um, um, just the basic information about it, but if it doesn't have a, a file for that host, it won't allow you to edit a role or create a role for that host. Um, it didn't give us a problem because I tried to connect to it and the first time it connects, even if it doesn't authenticate, it will still log the information about the host. Um, and it would log the host's uh, fully qualified name and IP address, as well as um, the, the host ID, etc. even if it didn't authenticate. Um, and so then after that, it knows that that host exists and you can create a role for it. Um, or alternatively, I guess you could populate it yourself. Um, bear in mind, obviously, that, that's not really intended. Um, and hopefully in the future, we can have a, a hash include bit that you can swap out to, to change the, uh, the data back end to perhaps the Postgres database or something else. Um, and there is also this history folder, which shows um, for each configuration for each role um, 
what changes were made. Um, so this says at the start, Jay Lewis altered the role for root at Lewis as follows, and actually um, plus everything. So this was the initial creation of the role, and then uh, John altered the role, and you can see that John just took away day any and added Friday. So if you need to find out who did what when, um, you have a um, a history of the changes to each role there. Um, I'm referring to them as roles because typically you would, um, well, a lot of companies have a role user that, that or an application user that's running, you know, JBoss or uh, whatever. Um, and the, the, the point is that they are not um, a user's personal account, although you you could use it for that if you like. Um, now I have this other um, virtual machine which was intended to be a third party. So imagine this is a third party machine which is not under your control um, and we have a user on there called Jenny. Um, and let's just create this user. And Jenny has a key, um, key Jen, uh, which pr perhaps doesn't have a, uh, a passphrase. So we'll not put a passphrase on that as an example. Um, but um, and Jenny is not part of the system, and they're a, a you know, and perhaps they're connecting via a VPN or something. So. Um, but, um, oh, actually, I should have created that key as Jenny. So let's just go and do that. Uh, from Jenny. Um, we'll just do that again. OK, so then we have Jenny's key. Uh, Jenny's SSH key. This is... Right, so they have a public key. Um, and you want to permit them to access perhaps our test server. Um, so what they would typically do is they would send you their public key. Um, so let's do that. Um, and normally you would have to log on to your test server and you would put that in your authorized keys file and then they could log in um, and then they can start editing the authorized keys file and adding all sorts of extra keys for their friends and you, you don't want that. Um, so as as our uh, as our administrator, let's do this as John, shall we? Um, on our administ administrator's workstation, um, we'll create Jenny's key. Dot pub, and so we're just going to throw uh, this key. Yes, I did see that I've missed the S off the front, <laughs> but never mind, I can type it in. There we go. So Jenny's key is there. Um, and what I'd really like to do um, is register this key with the system. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say open AKC, submit. Uh, Jenny's key. And I'm going to add a comment that says third party key from Jenny. Okay. So we have stored a key from Jenny. Um, Not quite sure why I did that twice, but maybe I need to debug that <laughs> anyway. Um, but we have stored Jenny's key, and you'll find if you actually look in the server, um, in 
data keys, you'll find that there is another key um, that we could uh, look at that. And then we have a, this is a key fingerprint not not associated with the user there's the public key it's a static key it was registered at this point and that's the the comment for the key um so the thing we're actually interested in is the um uh the, the key fingerprint i'll go back to my administration workstation over here and i'm going to say i want to edit the role for this uh test server again um and now what I'm going to do um, well I'm just gonna I'm just gonna dump that there so I've got it a record of it um, and I'm going to make another roll we'll copy the one that we've got there um, and this time I'm going to say that this roll is not a user role, it's a key. Um, this, this, um, so rather than user, that could be group, so that um, you could say any user in this group is allowed. But this is a specific type, this is a key type. And I'm actually going to use the key fingerprint as the uh, authentication token here put that key fingerprint in there um, and we're saying okay well everything else is the same um, you could define you could find out what um, actually yeah we could we could define find out what Jenny's IP address is um, and we could say okay well we could put that in there um, and they could that would be a restriction that it would only work that key would only work from that IP address but um, I'm going to come out of here, save that role, um, and uh, now uh, we should from from Jenny from our third party and click. Well, I guess you couldn't expect me to record more than an hour in one take, um, so there was a slight um, <laughs> hiccup with my video there. But we'll pick up where we left off. Um, Jenny, having had a key um, registered uh, by John, submitted into the system, uh, should then be able to SSH to root at test hyphen server. And yes. And she gets the same questions. Um, and log on to that there based on the. Um, uh, role defined uh, simply by the key fingerprint to the key that was submitted um, and this will allow you to um, manage essentially what you would be doing in an authorized keys file um, entirely centrally for every machine um, and um, that would actually allow you to not only to turn off um, password authentication which you you know might want to do but you could also turn off um, the authorized keys so that the users can't start um, adding their own authorized keys etc they would have to come to some centralized administration point where you can um, you know say who are you and put comments on the keys and those will go in the log files and so say this this person logged in um, and uh, in addition to that um, we'll go back to the server and we'll have a look at uh, the key logs. Key logs. Actually, let's we'll log out of here. And in the key logs for today, um, the most recent one, uh, we can cat 2120. Um, and you'll obviously see that those are the same. Um, and uh, yeah, this is what we typed. Um, 
and um, the session ID obviously matches. Um, currently up here it says underscore none because it that's the user that's in the um, uh, in the definition for the key. Um, I might have to massage that around a little bit to make it more useful, but um, essentially that's uh, that's everything. Um, the um, the role definition uh, currently has user or group or key, um, which again, as I said, allows you to um, manage what would otherwise be authorized keys across an entire estate. Um, and um, I do plan to add some extra um, types, one, one of which would be uh, a, a rotating key so that every time you use it, it generates a new one um, or, or generates it at the point when you use it. So um, it still validates that you are the user that you say you are. Um, and you presumably have to seed it with a by registering a personal key, but and then each time it would then replace that with a new one. Um, but that's uh, that's for post 1.0. We'll deal with that as uh, as we get it. But that's my uh, that's my demo. <laughs> Only one cut. <laughs> Thanks very much. Cheers.